This Monday, Thursday, as we gather together as a continuation from Palm Sunday, uh, we are journeying with Jesus, his face set to Jerusalem, overturn the tables on Monday. We don't know a lot about Tuesday and Wednesday, but here we are on Thursday. This morning, he would have had the disciples prepare the upper room for the Passover meal. He gathered the disciples tonight to remember forward. To take that Old Testament Passover meal, but institute a new covenant of himself as he was the host and the giver. And the Lord instituted the Lord's Supper. Tonight we also have a special in our, these first two sections, in sections two and three, uh, we have over 24 kids, students, who are taking their first communion tonight. They've gone through instruction. Uh, amen, yeah, praise God, praise God. And you may or may not see, but on the front, there are all the chalices that they uh, painted themselves, that they will receive their first communion. And then tonight, they'll take those home with them as a faith memento of tonight as well. Uh, if you're in person with us and you want to scan that QR code, especially if you're a first-time guest with us, we'd love to have you uh, check in. There's a digital bulletin also on that as well. Let's begin. Let's begin in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let's continue singing.
should be seated. It is an amazing gift that we have tonight as we celebrate the goodness of God, not only in the word, but also in this meal that the Lord prepared for us the night before he was crucified. As we continue with our service, we'll worship our Savior with our offerings. Uh, As the ushers uh, come forward to receive that offering, I invite you to uh, participate unless you give online. Just give them a thumbs up and let them know that you do that as well. And thank you for your generosity as it provides events like this tonight to become a reality. Ushers.
This evening, we will be experiencing the events of Monday, Thursday, through scripture, through song. A very similar approach to what Jesus and his disciples would have experienced that evening. I set the stage for you there already in the upper room as you hear these words from John chapter 13, being verse 2. 
During supper, when the devil had already put into the heart of Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, to betray him, Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands, and they had come from God and was going back to God, he rose from supper. He laid aside his, he laid aside his outer garments, and taking a towel, tied it around his waist. And then he poured water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with the towel that was wrapped around him. And Jesus came to Simon Peter, who said to him, Lord, do you wash my feet? Jesus answered him, what I am doing you do not understand now, but afterward you will understand. And Peter said to Jesus, you shall never wash my feet. And then Jesus answered Peter, if I don't wash you, you have no share with me. And Simon Peter then said to Jesus, Lord, not my feet only, but my hands and also my head. And then Jesus said to Peter, the one who has bathed does not need to wash except for his feet, but is completely clean. This ends our first reading.
A reading from John chapter 14, beginning at verse 1. Jesus said to them, Let not your hearts be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. In my Father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, would I, would I have told you that I go to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and will take you to myself, that where I am you may also be. And you know the way to where I am going. Thomas said to him, Lord, we do not know where you are going. How can we know the way? And Jesus said to him, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. of love that's called There's a chair that waits for you And a friend who understands everything you're going through But you keep sending at a distance
As we continue with our scripture readings, we are brought to the institution of the Lord's Supper. With these words which Jesus spoke to his disciples, their perspective, our perspective of this meal was forever changed. It is at this point that perhaps in the evening it felt a little darker. And maybe Jesus' words sounded a little more somber. But while these words may have seemed ominous to the disciples, to us they are now words of hope, of grace, and of love. With these words, Christ fulfilled the prophecy which the Passover feast represented. With these words, Christ prepared to be the sacrificial lamb whose blood has saved us from death and sin. With these words, your sins are forgiven. From Luke chapter 22, beginning verse 15. And Jesus said to them, I have earnestly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I tell you, I will not eat it until it's fulfilled in the kingdom of God. And he took a cup, and when he gave it thanks, he said, take this and divide it among yourselves. For I tell you that from now on, I will not drink of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. Our Lord Jesus Christ, on the night when he is betrayed, he took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to the disciples and said, Take, eat. This is my body, which is given for you. This do in remembrance of me. In the same way also, he took the cup after supper. And when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink of it, all of you. This cup is the new covenant in my blood which is shed for you, for the forgiveness of sins. This do as often as you drink of it in remembrance of me. As we approach the table of the Lord, let us do so with a word of prayer. O Lord God, on this night, we remember how Jesus gave us his holy supper and allowed himself to be betrayed so we can be saved. Let us pray for ourselves for Christ's church, and for the world. Lord, we confess that we are prone to stray. Guard and defend each of us from the temptations of the devil, the world, and our own sinful inclinations. Forgive our sins, strengthen our faith, and keep us as your own, never letting us be separated from your hands and from your love. Lord, as your Son washed his disciples' feet, and then offered himself in service by going to the cross. Give us humble hearts that are always ready to serve our families and our friends and our communities and even our enemies, caring for everyone in your name and using our lives to do your will. Lord, we lift up the sick, and the suffering, and the dying, and the grieving. Since your son suffered as we do, and since you know our needs far better than we do, give to each of them and each of us your gracious care. Lord, as we enjoy communion in the one bread and the one cup of your Son's body and blood, unite us with each other and with all who have gone before us in the faith. Feed us with your life so that we may serve you and love one another as our Savior loves us. Into your hands, O oh Lord, we place ourselves and all those for whom we pray, confident of the mercy that you showed to us because of Jesus, your Son and our Lord and Savior, who has taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. I invite our communion assistants to come forward.
please accept the invitation of the ushers as they will guide you. If you have any mobility issues, please let an usher know. We would love to bring communion to you. As Pastor Dan said earlier, you can see the beautiful chalices on the altar, and those are for our students that are receiving their first communion. Welcome to the table of the Lord.
This is my story. This is my song. Raising my Savior all the day long. This is my story. This is my
and that means true body and true blood, strengthen you, preserving the true faith into life everlasting. Depart in his peace with great joy. Your sins are forgiven. Amen. Grace, mercy, and peace be to you from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. For those of you I haven't yet met, my name is Randy Miller, one of the pastors here, and I know what you're thinking. This is going to be a really long service because you have three pastors sharing the platform up front. This is a very special moment, and for you first communicants who just had your first communion, we couldn't be more proud of you in taking that step uh, to grow with your Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. I want to share with you a story uh, about a restaurant that I read about in a book that I was reading. Uh, Based out of New York City, this restaurant was the bottom of the barrel, uh, and they rose to be the best restaurant in the world. When the new ownership took over the restaurant, the restaurant was two stars at best. You know, when you look it up on the maps, and it kind of gives those stars, it was barely two stars. It was a hole in the wall. It wasn't great at all. But 11 years later, that's about how many years the First Communion students have lived, so imagine that. 11 hard years It became a four-star restaurant with three Michelin stars, and it was named the best restaurant in the world. Last month, I was flying with my daughter, visiting with some grad schools, and I can't believe I was doing that because it only seems like yesterday when she was sitting there in a church pew receiving her first communion. But on that flight, the person next to me saw the book that I was reading. I'm old school. I've got to hold the book and feel the pages and mark it up. And it was a bright yellow cover. You couldn't miss it. And he leaned over and he said, what are you reading? What are some of the insights about this book that you're reading? And I said, well, I'm just amazed at how this restaurant made people feel like kings and queens and all the little things that they did. For example, when you would sit at this restaurant, you would sit at one of the tables and you would order a drink, the person taking your order would have hand signals like a a baseball player would. They would have hand signals behind their back letting the, the runner know what kind of water you wanted. If you wanted bottled water that was flat, the person would put their hand out like this and then the runner would come over with bottled water in an instant. If you wanted sparkling water, they would flutter their fingers behind their back and sparkling water would instantly appear. If you wanted tap water, the server would just do this with a thumbs up and someone would rush over with tap water and it would appear magically right in front of you. One time this restaurant saw that a couple had plans for a beach vacation and those plans got dashed and they had to cancel their reservations. So the restaurant brought in sand and beach chairs, beach balls, and completely changed the restaurant into a beach scene for this couple. Another time, this restaurant noticed that this couple didn't ever experience snow with their children. And it snowed outside in New York City on this particular night, and so they treated the family to a sledding hill that was very popular in New York City. Come to find out, the guy on the plane next to me, as I was recounting these stories, he was getting really excited, and and he said, you know, that's very interesting because I work in the food industry for a taco company. And my team has been badgering me and hounding me to read this book. And I told him, I said, you should read this book. If you're in the service industry, it's phenomenal. It's just great. So when the flight landed and my daughter and I got off the plane, the person who sat next to me talking up this book, he said, hold on a minute. And he was fishing in his backpack. And we had things to see and places to go. And I was getting really impatient. And I almost gave up. And and he finally took out of the backpack a bunch of gift certificates for free tacos at his restaurant. And he goes, here, I want to give you this. And I felt like a king that day after that long flight, and my daughter felt like a queen, just for the thoughtfulness and for him to give something um, of his own and just to be so generous, to be so generous. Now, I'm not saying reading this book is going to guarantee you free tacos, But what I am saying is that when someone makes a big impression like that on you, you remember that. When someone makes you feel like you're the only person in the room, that's a special moment. When someone treats you like a king or a queen, like you're royalty, that really means a lot in our hearts and in our lives. And it's such a great picture for us on this night, on Monday, Thursday, as Jesus 
has this meal with his disciples. And he has this meal with his disciples. It's not just with his disciples, but he had you and he had me in mind. He celebrated this meal so long ago. And and he said in Luke 22, as he told the disciples in verse 15, he said, I have eagerly desired to eat this Passover with you. Notice Jesus said, I have eagerly desired. He was He was waiting in anticipation to have this meal. He was excited. He was looking forward to it. Not just that it was a meal with his disciples, but that he would start and institute a new meal for you and for me. That he wanted to have this meal with you, with all of us together. And it's such a wonderful picture. As he he goes on, he says, I'm not going to eat again of this meal until it's fulfilled in the kingdom of God. And he took a cup, and when he had given thanks, he said, Take this and divide it among yourselves. Share this meal. Don't keep it to yourselves. Share this meal with others. For I tell you that from now on, I will not drink of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. He says it a second time. The kingdom of God. This meal is about a king. This meal is about the king and the Lord and the Savior of our life and the steps that he took to redeem us, to save us, to forgive us of all of our sins. Everything Jesus did on this night, thousands of years ago, he had you and me in mind. And he flips the script. He's not a king where he demands to be served. He's not a king where he barks his orders and we comply and say, yes, Jesus, we're going to do that. He flips the script. This king serves us. This king treats us like royalty. This king treats us like we're the only one in the room. Whenever we have communion and we share in this meal, he is serving us. And he's serving us his very best. And he's so generous with his love and his grace and his mercy. And he gives us this meal to strengthen our faith, to forgive us of our sins, to give us the strength that we need to face the challenges in life. He gives us this meal to remind us that we're not alone, that we walk together as a community. So when we approach this meal, the next time it's offered, sometimes we approach it thinking we have to have our act all together, thinking that we have to be worthy enough, thinking that we have to bring our best to Jesus. But that's not the point of this meal. The point of communion is that we bring our worst. We bring our brokenness. We bring our sin. We bring our failures and our faults. And we say, Jesus, we've sinned. Jesus, we've messed up. Our King Jesus invites us to bring all of the darkness that we have in our hearts, to bring it to him in this meal. So don't wait to take this meal the next time it's offered until you've got it all together. This meal is about how Jesus gives you his Holy Spirit to forgive you your sins, give you a new life, and that's the new life we're going to celebrate in a few days on Easter Sunday. But until then, we journey with him through Good Friday. Because on this Monday, Thursday, we see how we keep trusting in Jesus and he builds our faith and builds our confidence and strength in him that we don't have to have it all together to come to him, that he is our king serving us and helps us feel like royalty in his kingdom. So First Communion students, I want to challenge you to keep growing. This is not your final step in your life of faith. In fact, this is the first of many steps because it reminds you of your baptism, the step that your parents took, and you're building on those steps. And so we encourage you to continue to grow in Jesus, whatever that looks like in your spiritual life. And parents and grandparents, you've brought your child to this moment. You remember their baptism, and now here they are in First Communion. Cherish these moments and continue to pour into them your faith, the faith that Jesus has given to you, and watch them flourish in life. And maybe some of you in the extended family, maybe some of you parents and grandparents, you flew in, traveled across town to celebrate this moment. You're wondering about Jesus, you're not sure about Jesus, or maybe you've been burned by religion and you're just here because your child or grandchild or or niece or nephew, this is very important to them, so you're here to celebrate with them. I would encourage you to have a spiritual conversation, to continue to to share your doubts and your questions and your wonderings with, with a spiritual leader, with a pastor so that you too, just as your family's growing in faith, can continue to see Jesus in everything that you do. And to the Gloria Day family, my challenge to you is this. Our mission is that more people would live life with Jesus every day. 
our King Jesus wants to share this meal with more people. And it's wonderful that we celebrate it with these First Communion students and these families, but there's more people in our community who need to be treated like royalty. More people in our community who have brokenness and darkness and they need to bring it to, to a savior who can save them. Share your faith. Take this moment on Monday, Thursday, what Jesus gives to us and share it with others. Approach this meal with strength and confidence that your King Jesus serves you. And as we celebrate him this Easter Sunday, he will continue to be with us and he promises never, ever to leave us. In Jesus' name. Amen. As we close out this service on Monday, Thursday, we're reminded of the events that happened on this night, just not, this, uh, not only this meal, but the events that followed this meal as everything was cleared up and Jesus went to the garden to pray. And in less than 24 hours, he would be crucified on a cross. The disciples betrayed him. The disciples abandoned him. No different than what we would have done in that same moment. So what you're going to see is what we call the stripping of the altar. It's a very ancient custom to be able to symbolize these moments, these very dark and lonely moments that Jesus faced for you and for me. You're going to see the communion elements disappear. You're going to see the altar removed and the elements on the altar removed and symbolism of Jesus being alone and suffering and dying on the cross, preparing us for Good Friday. We continue to worship our Lord in somberness for the sacrifice he gave to us as he takes the steps towards the garden to be betrayed and eventually crucified on the cross.
Scripture tells us that as Jesus finished the meal, disciples and Jesus went to the Mount of Olives, Garden of Gethsemane. And then he took three of his disciples with him and asked them to watch and pray. The events of his arrest, the trial, the torture are all happening tonight. And so we come back tomorrow, Good Friday, and we see love expressed on the cross. Jesus' outstretched arms for us, dying that we might live. And so I invite you to join with us to stand. After we receive the benediction, we'll sing the song, Go to Dark Gethsemane. So receive the blessing of our Lord. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord look upon you with his favor and grant you his peace now and forevermore. Amen. <laughs>